A federal trial got underway in North Carolina this week that could affect the future of voting rights nationwide. The Justice Department and, C and civic groups like the NAACP and ACLU are hoping to put that state's restrictive voting law on hold until after this year's election. This time last year, the Supreme Court gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. It requires parts of the country with a history of voter discrimination to seek federal approval before making changes to their voting laws. And 40 of North Carolina's 100 counties were covered at the time of the decision. Just a month later, North Carolina's Republican legislature and its Republican governor, Pat McCrory, enacted a spate of tough new voting restrictions. They lopped a week off the early voting period. They, the, they ended same-day registration during early voting, and they banned the extension of voting hours due to long lines at the polls. And starting in 2016, voters will have to show a government-approved photo ID card. As for what qualifies as approved, student IDs do not count, even ones from state universities. That's part of the reason why students have joined the Justice Department and groups challenging this law. Most of the people affected, the people who vote early, who wait in long lines at the polls and whose IDs wouldn't qualify, they are people who vote for Democrats. The specific hampering of the youth vote would have been enough to give the state to Republican John McCain in 2008. As the New York Times reported this week, young voters went so overwhelmingly for Barack Obama in 2008 that he won North Carolina despite losing every other age group. But it's not just in North Carolina that they're fighting these laws. Republicans have been beefing up voter restrictions all across the country since the Republican takeover of state houses in 2010. The Justice Department is now beginning to push back, and North Carolina is one of the first true tests. A ruling is expected sometime in the next month. And here to tell us more about this, about this week's trial, we're joined by the Reverend William Barber, head of the North Carolina NAACP, one of the groups contesting North Carolina's law. And Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, one of the top authorities in the justice system and co-author of the new book, Uncertain Justice, The Roberts Court and the Constitution. And still here, of course, at the table is MSNBC's Joy Reid. I'll begin with you, Reverend Barber. Do you think a persuasive case was made at this week's trial? I do. You know, there's a scripture in the, <clears throat> on the Old Testament, Isaiah 10, that says, Woe unto political leaders who make unjust laws and pass oppressive decrees that rob the poor of their rights. <laughs> this law is about robbery. This uh, HB 589 that was passed by Tom Tillis and Berger and signed by McCory is the worst kind of voter ID. It is, it is when you intentionally uh, identify voters that you think will probably not support your political uh, extremism and then you conjure mm -hmm. up policies to to s suppress their right to vote and that's what we've seen here unjustly attacking 17 year olds from from pre-registering uh, rolling back same-day registration which is used heavily by students and 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 other minorities and the poor mm -hmm. uh, early voting rolling that back rolling back Sunday voting it is an all-out attempt in fact we call it the worst attack on voting rights since Jim Crow mm. that we've seen right here in North Carolina and we mm -hmm. made a tremendous case. Professor Tribe you write that the Supreme Court's decision to curb certain sections of the Voting Rights Act is part of the Supreme Court's philosophy under Chief Justice John Roberts. Can you explain that? Yes well Chief Justice Roberts has expressed the view quite often that we are basically past the period of Jim Crow and race discrimination, we've actually gotten to the promised land as long as we pay no more attention to race. I think that's profoundly misguided. But even if he were right, when you've got a case like this in North Carolina, and I very much agree with Reverend Barber's description, there is no possible way to understand what North Carolina is doing except as an attempt to disenfranchise racial minorities, young people, very old people, people who are likely to vote Democratic, and even under the remaining sections of the Voting Rights Act, which was not totally invalidated, thank goodness, under those remaining sections, this is a very simple, mm -hmm. straightforward case. Mm -hmm. And especially a court that basically took away the umbrella that the Justice Department had provided during the rainstorm that was still going on, Mm -hmm. leading uh, Justice Ginsburg to say in dissent, when you're not getting rained on, 
Okay. The last thing you want to do is throw the umbrella away. Well, right. for a court that threw that umbrella away, it had better put up a different umbrella, the judicial umbrella, when a racial rainstorm falls down on voters. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very good case to illustrate that the Voting Rights Act is still alive, though not in the greatest health. Mm -hmm. Reverend Barber, let me come back to you. We're also seeing North Carolina communities closing polling stations in certain parts of towns, namely where low income and black voters are. So how are citizens reacting? Well, citizens are standing up and certain that we're engaging, our legal team is engaging. What we're seeing here, Jonathan, is what happens when you roll back Section 5. This, this, this bill and the activity that we see show why we still need full implementation of Section 5. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> when this, when, section, when uh, the Supreme Court uh, gutted Section 4, one of the legislators said, now that the headache has been removed, we can move forward. This bill went from a 12-page bill focusing on limited voter ID to a 57-page bill the next morning uh, that, that rolled back 40 different mm -hmm areas of our law, 40 different areas, from 12 to 57 pages. There was no debate uh, in no committees, no expert testimony or anything. So what we're seeing is a fear, this is fear. The extremists like Tillis and Berger McCory know that their extreme agenda cannot survive in the public square. Mm -hmm. Less than 25% of the voters voted for them. The legislature is not 18% of the poll. The governor's under 30%. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to suppress the vote in every mm -hmm. way possible. Joy, let me bring uh, this, the, this question to you because what's happening in North Carolina is not an isolated right. incident. My question to you, though, is is it coordinated? Well, it, it's not coordinated in the sense that these states are necessarily talking to one another, although some of them are probably using model legislation because that is kind of the way legislation happens nowadays. But you did put, I mean, the lie was put to John Roberts, sort of absurd statement that we'll just stop paying attention to race and everything will be fine because it, Reverend Barber is absolutely right. No sooner did they gut Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act than states across particularly the South and in the Midwest and the Republican-controlled parts of the country immediately began trying mm -hmm. to lock in the gains that they made in 2020 10 and also to prevent further gains. Look, there are two ways you can respond to demographic tide. Because you have, first of all, reverse migration of a lot of African Americans from the North down to the South into states like Georgia, into states like North Carolina, making them more African American. And you also have this situation where Mitt Romney and John McCain each got north of 86% of the white vote throughout the South, and uh, Barack Obama got north of 90% of the black vote. So you have these mirrors where the white vote is becoming very, very Republican and the black vote is already very, very democratic so they, they, the the route to suppression of the vote is quite simple you <laughs> simply look at the way that african americans and minorities vote and you shut that down you look at the way younger people who tend to vote democratic vote and you shut that down and it's very simple so you don't have to say overtly that you're doing it on the basis of race but the result is the same mm -hmm. uh, professor tribe let me come to you young people are making a constitutional argument based on the 26th amendment against this law, the law in North Carolina, uh, placing restrictions on their ability to vote. Um, do they have a case? Do they have a good case here? I think it's quite a strong case because many of the provisions, especially the ones that tell college students that they can't use their college ID to identify themselves, but have to get an ID from their state of residence, it's very complicated, can't possibly be explained as anything other than an attempt to abridge the right to vote on account of age. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the explicit prohibition of the 26th Amendment. It's about time that that amendment was invoked. It hasn't been used to challenge any of these uh, ridiculous attempts at disenfranchisement before, but it ought to be used now because mm -hmm. if it doesn't apply here, it's very hard to see where it would apply. Mm -hmm. Joy, we just saw in the Mississippi Senate election, Senator Thad Cochran <laughs> saved by the African-American vote in Mississippi. Yeah. Um, but do we think <laughs> that this will wake Republicans up um, to getting back into a bipartisan effort to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. No, I, I mean, think the response that you've seen, um, particularly from the sort of the Tea Party people, the McDaniel side of that argument, has been this must be voter fraud. Look, these black people voting for Thad Cochran is ipso facto voter fraud. Clamp down on them more. So it's actually uh -huh. causing the opposite reaction rather than saying, gee, we finally found a way to get African Americans to vote for a Republican, namely have a Republican that's preferable to the other guy. The response has been the opposite. And so this is the fundamental problem. And it, it shows you the impetus for 
doing these kind of voter suppression efforts because there's a certain kind of person that is undesirable at the polls in part of the country. Unbelievable. Reverend Barber, mm -hmm. what do you hope? Yes. What do you hope for out of this trial? Well, what we hope is that the judge will in fact agree and enjoin these laws and say that they cannot be in effect in the fall. Uh, we're pushing forward. We don't know what the courts will do, but we understand the fight in, in, when it comes to voting rights. You have to have what I call LEAP, litigation, voter education, activation, and participation. We're in a fight for the very soul of this democracy. If you saw that trial, Jonathan, and you walked in, on their side you had five white men. On our side, you had Latino, you had African American, you had women, you had men, you had 93 year old um, Rosanna Eaton alongside college students, you had Carolyn Coleman and ministers and civil rights activists alongside other uh, persons who c are concerned about democracy in its fullest sense. We know in 2012, 70% uh, of African Americans voted higher than ever before. We've seen whites beginning to vote their future and not their fears. We see students being activated. That means the old South is changing, a new South is rising with new demographics, and these extremists like Tillis, Berger, McCoy are afraid of that. We're going to continue to push forward. We have 50 young people in the streets organ uh, registering voters right now. We're going to fight in the courts. We're going to fight in the legislative halls. We're going to fight in the streets. And we're surely going to fight at the ballot box. So, Joy, Reverend Barber is, is fired up and, and ready to go. But I'm wondering, are these laws stirring up voters to action in mm. other places where this is happening? And is trying to take away a per person's right to vote a strong way of motivating them. This is sort of like a leading question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Look, the great irony of voter ID and voter suppression efforts <clears throat> is that they might be the greatest motivator right. ever to minority voting. We saw it in 2012, uh, you know, in places like Ohio, where the efforts to cur roll back early voting, et cetera, really spurred African Americans in particularly right. to vote. We saw it in Florida, where cutting back early vote and those attempts made people feel, look, I'm not voting for the present. I'm voting for me. I'm, you cannot stop me from doing this. And so actually, ironically, in places like Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, across the South, it's actually sparking more voting behavior. I mean, I, when it happened, I was saying to people, look, the last thing you want to do <laughs> yes. is to tell a black person they can't vote. They That's will right. stand in yeah. line for as long as it takes mm -hmm. because too many people fought and died and sacrificed for that ability to wait in line, to have your voice heard. Yep. Your candidate might lose, but at least you did your part. Right, especially an older black Jonathan. person, because we all know how our grandmothers are. Exactly. The last thing you want to do is tell grandma that she can't vote because she will stand in line for 10 hours if right. it takes. Exactly. Reverend Barber, real quick. Yeah, when we saw Rosanelle Eaton was going through the, the checkpoints, you know, they check you for everything going in the federal court building, she was singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. <laughs> 93 years old, and she says, I'm gonna live to vote some more just because they're trying to take my right to vote. Mm -hmm. It's on in the South, my brother. It is on. She's seen a lot, and I can't wait to see what happens in the South um, in the midterm elections. My thanks to Reverend William Barber for joining the conversation, and to Lawrence Tribe, Joy Reid, you'll both be back in the next hour.